Welcome to this Neural Network Programming Series. In this episode, we're going to analyze the training results of a neural network by building, plotting, and interpreting a confusion matrix. Without further ado, let's get started. In this episode, we will build some functions that will allow us to get a prediction tensor for every sample in our training set. We'll see how we can take this prediction tensor and create a confusion matrix. This confusion matrix will allow us to see which categories our network is confusing with one another. Let's get started with some code. We're here in the notebook now where we've been working over the past couple of episodes. I'm not gonna go over the steps that it took to get here, because if you want to know those steps, you can just look at the previous video. Where we're starting out here is with a trained network. We used PyTorch to train our network, but the framework doesn't matter here. What we're going to cover applies to any framework. All we need to create this confusion matrix is to have a tensor of predictions and the tensor that has the corresponding true values or labels. If we have those two things, then we can create a confusion matrix in this way. So if you want to see how we created and trained our network up to this point, be sure to check out the previous videos in the series. Before we jump into the code, I want to take a quick look at what we're trying to achieve. We're trying to build this confusion matrix. It's available on deepblizzard.com on the corresponding blog post for this video. So if you want to check it out, go there. The link is in the description. Now this confusion matrix has three axes. On the X axis, we have the predicted labels. On the Y axis, we have the true labels. And inside the confusion matrix, we have these colors which build a heat map for us. Now the color corresponds to higher values. So the higher the values, the darker the color. And what we see here with this dark set of squares going down the diagonal is what we wanna see when we're training our network. And this is because the diagonal is where the predicted label is equal to the true label. So if you take, for example, the first category on the x-axis, which is a t-shirt, and then you go all the way up to the top where you see the corresponding true label t-shirt, we can see that the number there, the 5,431, that number means that the network predicted a t-shirt 5,431 times when the true label for that prediction was actually a t-shirt. So that means that the network was correct 5,000 times for that particular category. Now, if we go down from there and we start looking at the other categories, we can see that four times the predicted label was a t-shirt and the actual label was trouser. And then 92 times the network predicted a t-shirt when the actual value was a pullover. We don't want any positive values to be outside of the diagonal. We want all the values to be going right down the diagonal. That would mean the network was 100% accurate. So what this allows us to do is tell where our network is getting confused. So if we look at large values that are outside of the diagonal, that's where we can really start to see, okay, this is where the network's getting confused. If we look at the t-shirt, for example, and then we see that large number, that 1159, we can see that the network predicted incorrectly 1159 times a shirt. So the network predicted t-shirt when the actual value was a shirt. So we can kind of understand why the network would be getting that confused. So typically what we'll see in the confusion matrix is the network getting confused on categories that are sort of similar to each other. So in order to build this, what we need to do is take all of our categories and we need to run them on the X and Y axis and then we just iterate over all of our predictions and corresponding true labels, and we just count up for each square how many times did this occur, and that will give us the confusion matrix. To do this, we'll build a rank two tensor that actually has this data inside of it, and then we'll be able to plot that data to generate this image that we see here. So let's jump back over into the code and see how this is done. All right, so we're gonna start out by just checking out the two things that we need, which is gonna be our training set and our training set targets. We're gonna look at the length of both of these. All right, they're both 60,000 in length. And this is because the Fashion MNIST data set that we're working with has 60,000 samples. So in the training set, we have 60,000 images. And then in the targets attribute of the training set, we also have 
60,000 corresponding labels. With PyTorch datasets, we access the labels via the targets attribute. What we need to do is to get a predictions tensor that has 60,000 predictions for all samples in our training set. We can use this predictions tensor and compare it with the targets tensor, and then this will enable us to generate the confusion matrix. So to do that, we're going to build a function here that will go through our entire training set and produce a prediction. All right, so we're gonna name the function get all preds for get all predictions. And then we're gonna pass to this function our model or our network, and then we're also gonna pass a data loader. And the reason we're doing this is because we don't wanna pass the entire training set of 60,000 samples to our network at one time. Our machine's not gonna be able to handle that computation all at once. So what we wanna do is break up the training set into batches and then just predict on each batch at a time and gather all of these predictions up into a single tensor. So that's why we're gonna pass a data loader in, that way we can generate batches. So in the first line of the implementation of this method, we're gonna create a tensor that we're gonna return called all preds, and then we're gonna set it equal to a new PyTorch tensor that's empty. And then what we're gonna do is go through all of the batches in our data loader. So we're gonna iterate over this data loader by creating a for loop for batch in loader. The next line, we're gonna unpack this batch into an images and labels tensor. Then we pass the images to our model and we get back the predictions for that batch. And then we're going to concatenate these predictions to the all predictions tensor. To do this, we're gonna use the torch.cat function and we're gonna do this on the first dimension. This will give us a tensor of predictions for all samples from our training set. All right, so let's go ahead and run this code. So now we have that function defined. Now to make the call, all we have to do is create a data loader and then pass in our network and our data loader to this function, get all preds that we just defined. So we're gonna create a data loader called prediction loader and we're going to pass our training set in and then we're also gonna set the batch size. I'm gonna set mine at 10,000. You may find that you need to set this a little bit lower depending on the resources of your machine. Then we pass the network and this prediction loader into the get all preds function and then return to us is going to be a prediction tensor that contains predictions for all samples in our training set. So we're gonna call it train predictions or train preds. So let's run this code. We'll see that it is going to take several seconds to actually do this computation. All right, so now we have our train preds tensor. That's a tensor with predictions for every sample in our training set. So now let's just take a look at the shape of this tensor. The shape of this tensor is 60,000 by 10. For every one of the 60,000 samples in our training set, we have 10 prediction categories and the network has given us a value, a prediction value for each one of those categories. The category with the highest prediction value is the one the network is predicting most strongly. So to figure out which category has the highest prediction, we can use the argmax method. But before we do that, I wanna show you something about PyTorch right here really quickly. So let's just take a look at the requires grad attribute on the train predictions tensor that we just created. And I want you to see that it's true. And what this means is that this particular tensor required PyTorch's gradient tracking feature. So in past episodes, we would turn PyTorch's gradient tracking feature on and off depending on whether or not we needed it based on whether or not we were training. So in this case, we don't actually need gradient tracking because we're not training. But this says that gradient tracking is on for this tensor. So what exactly does that mean? You might think that it means we're gonna have a gradient for this particular tensor. So if we check the grad attribute on the training predictions tensor, you might think that we're gonna have a value there. Well, let's just see. Okay, there's no value for this particular attribute. So what's up with this? Why does requires grad say true? Well, remember during the training process, we don't get a gradient value for any of our tensors until we call backward on the tensor. So no gradients have been calculated because we haven't done any back propagation. If we look inside the grad underscore fn attribute, we're gonna see a value. This value is the function that led to this tensor's creation. And let's just see if we have a value for this. And we do. We have this particular tensor whose graph is being tracked. 
The problem with this is that whenever we're doing predictions, also known as inference, we don't want the extra overhead associated with keeping track of the graph. So what we typically do and what we should do, which I didn't do before because I wanted to show this example, is we need to get our predictions without tracking the gradients or without creating a graph. So that's what we're gonna do in this next line. In order to get the predictions without gradient tracking, we have a couple of options. We have seen in the past that we turn off gradient tracking globally, but we also have a local way of doing that. And that's with what we call a context manager. So we use the with keyword and we use torch.nograd. And then all we do is inside of this block of code, any computations that we do will be done without tracking gradients. So this is a way to locally turn off gradient tracking. So if we just went through a training process, we could have our gradient tracking on, and then afterwards we wanna do some predictions, some inference, then all we would have to do is include our calls to the network inside of a locally controlled gradient tracking. So we say with torch no grad, let's do these computations. All right, so we're gonna do the same computation and recreate or reinitialize our train predictions tensor. And I haven't run the numbers on this, but it should be potentially a little faster and it's also should use less memory because it's not keeping track of the graph. Now let's just verify that it's not keeping track of the graph. Let's check the requires grad attribute on the tensor now. Okay, it says false for this tensor, which means this tensor did not require gradient tracking. Why? Well, it's because we locally turned it off when we created this tensor. Now let's check the gradient. Obviously we're not gonna have anything there because we didn't do any back propagation. And then let's, here's the thing that we're gonna see that's different. We're gonna check the gradient function, which is essentially the graph for this particular tensor. And we're gonna see that indeed there's nothing there. The value is not set. So for that reason, we're using less memory. We're not tracking the graph. But anyways, that was just a quick little example of how we can turn gradient tracking off locally with PyTorch. Now there is another option, which I can just show you real quick on the website here. So this is another option for turning off gradient tracking is just to annotate or decorate your function with this particular decoration at torch.nograd. And that means anytime that this function gets called, it's gradient tracking is gonna be locally called off within the context of the execution of this function. So definitely keep that in mind if you're working with PyTorch. All right, now that we have the training predictions tensor for all of our training samples, we can take that tensor along with the training set targets, pass this into our get num correct function that we defined in the last video, and we can see how many we got correct. So let's do that. And we see that we have 52,813 correct, which is an accuracy of about 88%. So now we're ready to build our confusion matrix. So to build a confusion matrix, we need to have the targets, which are the labels. We also need to have a corresponding predictions tensor. So we have the prediction tensor, but what we need, we have 10 predictions for each sample. We need to just know the one, the argument or the label that has the maximum value because this is the one that the network was predicting most strongly. So to do that, we just call the argmax method on the train predictions tensor, and we call this method with respect to dimension one. So let's run both of these cells. So the first sample in the training set has a label of a nine and then zero, zero, and so on. And then if we look in the predictions tensor at the argmax values, we can see that the first prediction, the highest value was a nine, second prediction was a zero, a zero, and so on. So we can see that these first three predictions, the predicted label matches the target label. So these are correct predictions. These first three and the last three are also, the 305 also represent correct predictions. So what we wanna do is we wanna pair off each one of these prediction labels and target labels. And in order to do that, we're going to use the torch.stack function and we're gonna do it with respect to dimension one. And let me just show you what that gives us. If we look at the stacked shape, we see that we have 60,000 rows and each row has two values. So we've essentially taken, taken these two tensors, turned them into uh, columns and then kind of smushed them together. And if we just look at that, we can see we have pairs and the first value in each pair is the true label and the second value in each pair is the predicted label. 
So now we can iterate over all of these pairs and count up how many times each combination occurs. So when we have matching label and prediction, it's gonna be across the diagonal in our confusion matrix. And then if we don't have corresponding pairs, that's gonna be off the diagonal. So it's gonna be an incorrect prediction. So let's just see how we're going to access one of these um, whenever we start iterating across of them. So we're gonna look at the first one and we're just gonna change it into a Python list. And we're gonna see that we get the pair in a list form. We'll be able to unpack this pair, get the first value, second value, and then just add up or increment the current value that's sitting in that spot on the confusion matrix. So to actually do this, we need to create a confusion matrix. So we're gonna call torch.zeros, we want a 10 by 10 confusion matrix, and that's because we have 10 categories in our training set. And then we'll go with N64, uh, we'll make that a 32. We'll go with the N32 as our data type, and let's just see what this looks like. So now this is going to be, or currently is, our confusion matrix tensor. CMT. So right now all the values are zero and as we iterate over the pairs we're going to be incrementing the occurrences of each square. And to do that let me just show you or remind you what this is going to look like. We have all the pairs that look like this at the top. If we access one of them and call two lists on it then we get back a list with the two values. And then just so if we unpack the two values like this we can say j comma k is equal to the stacked 0.2list, then what that's going to do is that's going to give us j is going to be a 9 and then k is also going to be a 9. So that's that's the way this is working here in this for loop. We say for each pair in the stack tensor, I want to unpack the pair in a into j and k variable. Then in the confusion matrix, I'm going to find the jth row and the kth column and I'm going to get the value from that and set that equal to the value plus one. It may be even better to rename these. Actually, I think so. So we'll call this one the true and we'll call this one the we'll call this one the true label and we'll call this one the predicted label. So we go true label, predicted label, and then true label, predicted label. So what this is doing is it's saying Find the square where the true label and the predicted label are occurring, get that value, set it equal to whatever it is plus one. And so that is essentially going to count the occurrences of corresponding categories. So how many times did the network predict this particular category? So let's just run this and see the result. So it'll take a second because it's going over 60,000 pairs. And then now if we just take a look at the, what it looks like, we can see that we've counted up all the occurrences. Now, like we said before, going down the diagonal, we see the larger numbers, which is where the true label is equal to the predicted label. And our network was trained up to 88% accuracy. So right now we're actually expecting to see a lot more values going down our diagonal than elsewhere in the confusion matrix. So that's how you build the confusion matrix. And that's gonna be the same process, whether you're using PyTorch or you're using just some other library or just Python. If you have a list of labels and a list of predictions, you can pair those up and then generate this confusion matrix. So let's see how we can plot this now. So plotting a confusion matrix. All right, so if that was kind of hard for you to conceptualize and understand, then I have good news. What we can do is just import confusion matrix from scikit-learn.metrics, and there is a function in there that will generate this confusion matrix for us. So we'll use that in this example to plot it just to show you that it's the same. We're also going to import pyplot from matplotlib, and then we also need a we also need another function to actually plot the confusion matrix. And that's coming from resources.plotcm, which is a local Python file that I have on my system. I'm gonna show you the contents of that one in just a second, but let's just run this code. Okay, we have those in, and I wanna generate the confusion matrix. Now, we're gonna be using the scikit-learn.metrics uh, library for this, and what I wanna just show you is that it's gonna be exactly the same as what we just generated. We're gonna initialize a confusion matrix using this confusion matrix function, and we're passing in the train set targets and the train predictions 
tensor that we created by calling argmax on it with respect to the first dimension. And we see that they returned a NumPy ND array. It looks exactly the same as what we did with PyTorch. If you look down at the bottom, we have 240, 11, 5, 7, 26. If we look up here, 240, 11, 5, 7, 26. This is a PyTorch tensor. This is a NumPy ND array. But either way, they both work. Okay, so now all we need to do is plot. So the names of the categories is just a tuple of the names and they are listed here. Now, where did this come from? Well, this came from understanding our data set and these values, let me just show you the values on the website. So if we scroll here, we have a table with all of the values and those values basically come with the, with the data set. All right, so we're ready to plot this thing. Let's call this code, see that it plots, and then I'll show you what the plot confusion matrix code looks like. So it shows the confusion matrix data, and it also plots the confusion matrix. You can notice at the bottom, the data corresponds with what we saw earlier, 240, 11, and 57, 26. So just to show you that this also works with the PyTorch tensor, we do CMT, which is the PyTorch tensor confusion matrix tensor that we created. We run this code. This time it says that, oh, it's a tensor and same result. Okay, so that's how you do it. Now, all you need to know is this code that lives here inside resources.plotcm and this function. So let's take a look at that. Okay, so for this to work, you need to have in your current directory where the notebook or where the code is executing, you need to have a resources folder. And inside that resources folder, you need to have a Python file called plotcm.py. And then inside of that file, you need to have a function called plot confusion matrix. And then that will enable you to import this particular function into your program in this way. So let's take a quick look at that file. So I'm here in this lizard code PyTorch directory. And just to show you, this is where my notebook is. And then just up here, I have a folder called resources. So we will go into that folder and we'll have a look and we have plotcm.py. And then if we take a look at the contents by getting the content of this file, we can see it imports some stuff and then defines the plot confusion matrix function. And this is the code that actually does that. In addition to importing the code in this way, you can just copy this function into your notebook and it'll, it'll work all the same. You don't have to worry about importing it. This code is going to be available on the website. So you can go copy it from there. And that's how you create, plot, and interpret a confusion matrix. If you haven't already, be sure to check out deeplizard.com where there's blog posts for each episode. There's even quizzes now that you can use to test your understanding of the content. And don't forget about the Deep Blizzard Hive Mind, where you can get exclusive perks and rewards. Thanks for contributing to Collective Intelligence. I'll see you in the next one. Greetings again, fellow organism. In the recent past, we trained our network to tell the difference between 10 different articles of clothing items. We can tell which categories our network is confusing with one another. I say to you, what the heck? An interesting question is lurking just beneath the surface of this whole ordeal. We say that our network has been trained. We say that our network is confused. Does this mean our network has knowledge? What I say next may shock your brain to the core in an existential way. But, I pose this question for a human, and I pose this question for a neural network. What does it mean to say that we know something? And fundamentally, how do we know that we know? If this sounds confusing, Maybe we should just stick to building confusion matrices. Or perhaps we should study epistemology, the branch of philosophy concerned with the theory of knowledge. knowledge.